Hi, I'm Dr. Tim Durkin with the Base Medical Team. Uh, in this video, I want to talk to you some of the questions we've gotten from wilderness medicine students about evaluation of shock, anaphylaxis, and other medical conditions in a diverse patient population. Uh, I have my friend Tico here with me, and Tico, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Tico Gangley. I'm an IFMGA ski and mountain guide. Um, we're, I'm working today out of um, San Juan Expeditions in Silverton, Colorado. Awesome. Well, welcome, Tico. So as we talk about this issue and evaluating uh, patients, um, then I think the first issue that is really important with any patient evaluation, regardless of their heritage, is just really to pay attention and do a good job listening uh, to the patient. I think when there's concerns about bias or a poor interaction between a clinician and a patient, frequently that starts with a patient who doesn't feel like their concerns are heard or their concerns are taken seriously. So just recognize that different people are gonna express things in a different way, and it's our job as clinicians, whether you're a physician or a first aider or anything in between, to really try to listen to that person and hear what their concerns are. So now that we've talked about listening to the patient, let's dial in on some specific areas of physical exam where we can uh, perhaps identify some medical problems a little bit more easily. Um, one area that I think it's really important to look at is the palms of the patient's hands. Even if the patient's heavily dressed, the hands will be easy to access by removing their gloves. And, uh, and that's an area where um, people don't have a lot of skin pigment regardless of their heritage. And you can easily visualize the capillary beds and seeing if that area is well perfused or not. And then Tika, we were talking earlier about um, some changes that maybe people with darker skin might have on their hands, particularly in wintertime. Why don't you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, with, uh, with the dry air in winter, oftentimes like people of you know, darker skin color get ashy and, uh, and a sort of, that sort of dry pallor um, color can look pretty scary if you're not used to what it is. Um, and it's just a normal reaction to dry, dry air. Yeah, that's, that's a great point of just being familiar with that as a normal variation in a, in a diverse patient population and recognizing that for what it is and not a, not a pathology. So that's great. Um, let's talk more about some other physical exam findings. Another physical exam finding that is independent of ethnicity is the presence of diaphoresis or abnormal or pathologic sweating that might be present in a patient experiencing a shock state or a diabetic emergency. Now, obviously, if we go hiking up the mountain in the summertime, we're going to get warm and we're going to sweat. But if it's cold out or the person is not exerting and they're, uh, they're having a lot of moisture on their skin in that condition, then that's usually an indication of a significant pathology, either again a shock state or perhaps a diabetic emergency. Another area of the physical exam that's important to consider is looking in the patient's mouth. And that can give you a lot of information. If we look in someone's mouth and we see that the inside of their mouth is dry, that's a fairly strong indication that the person is dehydrated. Also, we can look at the mucous membranes and the lips to see if there is a healthy um, pink color to the mucous membranes and uh, good signs of blood flow and perfusion, or there's a paleness or a blueness there that might indicate low perfusion, anemia, shock, or hypothermia. And then as we talk about the way that a person's skin might appear as, as that relates to our medical evaluation, it's important to remember that there's a lot of things that might change the appearance of a patient, um, whether that's a low perfusion or a shock state, or perhaps, um, in, as we were talking about earlier, Tico, um, you had a client that had some changes to their skin because of their emotional state the other week. Is that right? Yeah, we, had, uh, we were about to ski off the top of the, uh, the Sultan here in Silverton. It's a decently big line. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he was from Vermont and, uh, and he, was, he was kind of scared up there and he was like, I feel like I'm pale as a sheet. And I was like, well, you were pale as a sheet this morning in the coffee shop as well. So Was he hung over? Uh, maybe. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. A lot. Some, some people have that when they're here in Silverton, yeah. so it's good. Yeah, so considering the, the general appearance of a person's skin, another tool that can be really useful if we're not entirely sure is capillary refill. And although this is a, a diagnostic tool that might be a little easier to use in someone who is fair skinned, it certainly is valid and will work in a diverse patient population. So to evaluate capillary refill, I wanna find a, a part of the patient's skin, usually maybe more closer to the trunk than out in the extremities that might be cool if we're out in the weather. And I 
I can just push my finger into the patient's skin and that pushes the blood out of the capillaries that are close to the skin. And that area will be a little bit more pale than the areas around it. Um, and then it usually takes in healthy people about three seconds or less for the, the color of the area where we put our finger to match the area around it. And if that timeline takes more than six seconds for that area to normalize after we push our finger onto it, then that's usually an indication of a low circulation state, whether that's a cold extremity, a shock state, or some other circulation problems. So capillary refill is another useful tool for a diverse patient population because we're comparing uh, the patient's skin in one area to another area as we apply this test. And then another thing to really pay attention to is the patient's mental status. As a patient has shock or other severe medical problems that reduce the circulation to their brain, that's gonna change their behavior. And you might see that someone gets agitated and activated by that, and then, uh, or you might see as they progress towards unconsciousness, they start to get more and more quiet and more and more withdrawn. And then Tico, you were talking about some experiences you had had in, um, in alpine climbing where you had seen some behaviors. And why don't you share that with uh, with yeah, the audience. Definitely. Like, uh, I feel like at, at altitude especially, or when we're dealing with extreme cold, I'm far more concerned with the patient or client that's sort of fading away and going within themselves and withdrawing than the uh, patient or client that's like feeling more and more energetic. Um, yeah, for sure. That person that's starting to withdraw, they're not really advocating for themselves. They're not going to draw attention to themselves. And they're, you know, somebody that might just quietly go in their tent and die. And yeah. Yeah. So definitely watching out for that interaction. But then even, you know, outside of alpine climbing, as we're just evaluating someone to do first aid on the side of the trail, just paying attention to the quality of the interaction. And are they able to carry on a normal conversation? Are their responses appropriate? Are their responses slow? Um, or is the person really agitated and combative? These are all, are all clues that, uh, that there's something amiss. So. Another skin finding that is independent of heritage and pigment is the temperature of the person's skin. And although the extremities might be cold if we're out in the environment, you can reach and touch the, uh, the upper chest or the upper back, the areas that are covered by the patient's clothing. And if those covered areas of the torso are um, noticeably cold to touch, that's a, usually a pretty strong indication of either a poor perfusion state such as shock or a situation um, where the patient has hypothermia potentially. And as we further consider that the patient might have shock or some other severe problem, then it might be useful to move away from subjective considerations of appearance of different parts of the patient's body and move to more objective measurements of their physiology. The most basic being measuring the pulse rate and the breathing. And then if you have the equipment available, the blood pressure might also give you some useful information. And then Tico, you were talking earlier about some diagnostics that you use on some of your high altitude trips. Yeah, I generally, these days, I generally carry a small pulse oximeter. And if you can keep the finger warm enough, um, I think it gives you like more definitive information than just taking a pulse. Um, and it does it in real time, which I think is quite helpful. Yeah, so I think there's several several useful points um, out of out of what you just said, which is a great point. So first, that um, you know, you pulse oximeters in the past few years have become remarkably much more affordable. Where they used to cost five hundred dollars or more, you can now get a decent pulse oximeter for like fifty or sixty bucks. So um, so as you touched on, you know, if the extremity is really cold, it's not going to have good enough circulation. There needs to be a good pulse in the capillary bed for that pulse oximeter to have a good pickup. The pulse oximeter gives us several pieces of good information as far as if the oxygen level is adequate and if we start to see that the patient is having a low oxygen level, particularly um, much lower than we would expect given the altitude, then that's a strong indicator that something is wrong. And also it gives us an objective measurement of the patient's heart rate, which also gives us uh, useful information. However, if the pulse oximeter is not picking up and giving consistent and reliable data or showing a decent waveform, then that's an indication that either the um, blood flow is restricted in the extremity because the extremity or the patient is cold or that there's reduced blood flow there because of shock or some other problem. 
I hope you found this very brief review of physical assessment as applied to a diversity context to be useful and enjoyable. Um, if you enjoy content related to wilderness medicine, wilderness rescue, and outdoor safety, I'd encourage you to subscribe here to our YouTube channel and check out our website at base-medical.com for more educational resources for wilderness medicine and search and rescue and outdoor safety and things like that. And then Tico, you wanna let people know if they're interested in a cool day of guiding out here in the San Juans or beyond where they can find out a little bit about what you're up to? Yeah, if you're interested in avalanche education, backcountry skiing, ice climbing, rock climbing in the San Juans of Colorado um, or Aspen zone, or um, we also have permits in the Cascades in Washington now, um, check us out at sanjuanexpeditions.com.